On this week's GCN Racing News Show, today Pugaccia edges ever close to GOAT status by winning Il Lombardia on Saturday. But just how good is he? We will be comparing him to some of the previous greats of our sport. We've also got Milano Torino, Gran Piemonte, the Women's Tour, Parry Tour, the Tour of Vendée, the European Track Championships and the first round of the UCI Cyclocross World Cup. It just never gets any quieter in the world of bike racing, does it? We'll start though with Il Lombardia. The race of the falling leaves was back in its traditional slot on the calendar this year, having taken place in the summer in last year's COVID hit season. And it was a stacked field, to say the very least. Alaphilippe, Evenepoel, Roglic, Pugaccia, Valverde, Woods, Nibali and the Yates twins amongst the many stars on show on the day. It was a day that felt like it took a little while to get going though. I think in part that feeling was down to the fact that we had live coverage from the very start, but also because we've become accustomed in 2021 to seeing races ignited far earlier than recent years. Now one man we were expecting to make an early move was Avonapool, but when he finally did make a move, it was in the wrong direction. The young Belgian was dropped on the final big climb of the day, the Paso de Ganda, clearly not on the form that he or we expected him to be in on the day. It was an acceleration from the shark himself, Vincenzo Nibali, that had put him in trouble. Now, whilst the Italian veteran was ultimately unable to sustain the pace that he himself had set, it did set up what turned out to be the race-winning move. Tadej Pugaccia, who has spent the two months since the Olympics trying to regain top form, used it as a springboard to make his own move. It was a surprise not to see Roglic glued to his wheel, as is so often the case, but it would later become clear that Roglic wasn't quite at 100%. The chase, therefore, was down to De Koenig Quickstep, but with Almeida also suffering, it was only really Fausto Masnada able to do the job for Alaphilippe. The world champion attacked over the top of that final big climb, but the gap to Pogaccia was still almost half a minute. What transpired over the next few kilometres was tactically very intriguing. Masnada, who'd been distanced over the top, managed to not only get himself back to the chasing group, but sail straight past them on the descent. By the foot of it, he'd managed to bridge himself across to Pugaccia, but soon after that was instructed by his team car to sit on the Slovenian, with the Kearney obviously deciding Alaphilippe was their better bet for the win. Alaphilippe was able to sit on that group behind, who'd got themselves well organised on the flat run into Bergamo. The gap came down to just over 20 seconds, and it looked like it was about to be closed. But then, it all went to pot. The group stopped working and started looking at each other instead. And so despite not getting any help from Masnada, Pogaccia's lead went up to over a minute by the time they reached the final climb of the day. From that moment, the end result was never really in doubt. Pogaccia is not only an exceptional climber, he also possesses a very fast sprint. And since Masnada doesn't, there wasn't much the Italian could do about it when Pogaccia kicked to the line. And so, Tadej Pogaccia wins the Tour of Lombardy at his first time of trying. It ends a truly remarkable season for the 23-year-old, which puts him right up there with the greatest riders of all time. 13 wins this year, 11 of which have been in World Tour races, two monument wins, Liège-Bastogne-Liège and Lombardia, plus three stage wins and the overall classification at the Tour de France, and an Olympic Games silver medal to boot. Now, only three other riders have won the Tour de France and Lombardia in the same year. Fausto Coppi, Eddie Merckx and Bernardino. Pugaccia is the youngest winner of Lombardia in 52 years and the youngest rider ever to have won more than one monument in a single season. He's the first rider of any age to win two monuments in a season since John Degenkolb did it in 2015 and the first rider to win this race on debut since Damiano Cunego back in 2004. And further to that, there are only two previous riders who've won two monuments and the Tour de France in the same season. Fausto Coppi, who did it in 1949 at the age of 30, and Eddie Merckx, who won three monuments and the Tour de France in 1969 at the age of 24. That, though, was Merckx's first win at the Tour de France. Pogaccia already has two. Now, it's always risky comparing anybody to Merckx, the greatest cyclist the world has ever seen, but I genuinely think we can regard Pogaccia as being close if we compare the two riders at the same age. Let's not forget, pro cycling has become far more specialised in the modern era with a greater strength in depth in the peloton, and that makes his achievements over the last two seasons even more impressive. What's great though, in my opinion, is the fact that these modern champions are out there racing full on right the way through the season in all kinds of different races. In the era of Froome and Contador, 
we barely saw them in the big one-day races, let alone win them. In fact, despite everything they achieved in their careers, Contador only ever won one one-day race, and Froome has never won one at all. And it's not just Pugaccia. Roglic, winner of La Vuelta for the last three years, was racing at the World Championships recently before going on to win the Giro della Emilia and Milano Torino in the lead-up to Lombardia. These guys just seem to love racing their bikes almost the entire season. For Roglic, it wasn't to be on Saturday. He'd have to settle for fourth place after Adam Yates outkicked him to the line. Masnada could be content with second, which is by far his best result in a monument, whilst Valverde, Alaphilippe, Godu, Woods and Egita rounded out the top 10. Rider of the day in my book, though, has to go to young Ben Tulit. The Alps in Phoenix rider was making his debut at the race at just 20 years of age and was up there with the big guns until midway up that final big climb. He'd eventually finished just outside the top 20 and just behind Avonapool and Mollema. And what a way that was to round out the World Tour races for another year. I thoroughly enjoyed that, I've got to say. And you might want to keep all that in mind when you vote on our World of Cycling Awards. So our final show of the year will be out on GCN Plus on the 20th of October, next Wednesday. And we'd like you to help us decide who should get those awards. There's a poll for that and we'll put a link to it in the description just below this video. I'll just wrap up the other one-day races in Italy last week now, starting with the Coppa Bernocchi, which took place on Monday. There, a strong group had gone clear before live coverage had even started, and by the time we actually had any proper footage from the race itself, Remco Evenepoel had gone clear of them, solo into the win around two minutes in front of Covey of UAT Team Emirates, with Masnada in third. At Milano Torino on Wednesday, the big guns had come out to play, and a 30-man group had pulled clear in crosswind, leading into the main climb of the Superga. It was the second time up that climb, though, that the race was decided, with Adam Yates putting in a searing acceleration right from the start. In the end, only Roglic was able to match him, and he was more than his match in a final sprint to the line, beating the Brit by 12 seconds in the end. Almeida, Pogaccia and Woods rounded out the top five there. And then on Thursday at Gran Piemonte, Matt Walls emerged victorious from a chaotic sprint, getting the better of Giacomo Nizzolo and Olaf Coy. Meanwhile in France, we had Paris Tour yesterday, now defined by its farm tracks and gravel roads. And what a race that was! Soon after live coverage started, Connor Swift of Arkea Samsic was on the attack, and he must have been incredibly frustrated when a puncture saw him fall back from what turned out to be the decisive move. The same thing happened to Frederick Friesson later on in the race, leaving just two riders out front, Frank Bonnemur and Stan de Wolf. Unfortunately for them, two very strong riders were in pursuit behind, Arno de Mar and Jasper Sturven. The pursuit lasted for what felt like an age, but eventually the bridge was made, almost in sight of the line. It was a thrilling finale, I've got to say, and one that was won in the end by de Mar. He played his cards perfectly at the finish and outsprinted Bonnemur in second, with Sturven having to settle for third. 24 hours before that, it was the Tour de Vendée, which had an equally enthralling finale. 21-year-old Swissman Alexander Balmer, who rides for the Groupama FDJ development team, found himself alone in the closing kilometres. However, his advantage over the chasers was always a slender one, but with just over 10 seconds with a kilometre to go, it looked as if he might just do it. Here's Carlton Kirby calling the last 500 metres of the race. Is he going to bring it home? This would be absolutely amazing if he actually gets there. Singler's on his case here. Hemmelbos and Hagen's out of the saddle as well. It's heartbreak potentially for him. Vermeersch is also on the case, but have they all left it too late? They're coming through at the very, very last here. Is he going to get it on the line? This is amazing. Last roll of the dice. Oh, he's been beaten. Delco coming through with Prada. I think, on the line. Oh, there you are. Ha! Arkea with the timing. Arkea with the bragging rights on the Welcome. day. Heartbreak for Balmer. You really had to feel for him there. It was Bram Velten, though, of Arkea Samsic who got the win in the end, his first ever as a pro rider. We also had six days of fantastic racing at the Women's Tour here in Britain last week. Four of the five road stages would end up in bunch sprints, and it was the former world champion Marta Bastianelli who took the first of those on stage one. The GC started to take shape on day two, with Amy Peters the fastest to the line from a group of 10 women that finished 42 seconds ahead of the rest. Tenth from 10 in that group was Peters' teammate Demi Vollery, and she put in an utterly dominant performance in the following day's individual time trial. 
With the remaining three stages all relatively flat, that time trial was always going to be pivotal in the general classification. And in winning that stage by over a minute from world hour record holder Joss Loudon, Vollering had put herself in a commanding position. And one that would never change by the end. Lorena Vibes of Team DSM took back-to-back -back wins on stages four and five, bringing her season tally of wins to 12 and her career tally to 35 at the age of just 22. She was unable to make it 13 on the sixth and final stage though. Elisa Balsamo took her first win in the Raybo Bands in her last race as a Valcar travel service rider. For Vollering, it rounded out what's been an exceptional season. She had a victory in the women's tour to Liège-Bastogne-Liège and La Course this year. A new champion has emerged, I think. Second overall went to Juliette Laboue of DSM with fellow French woman Clara Caponi of FDJ in third. And believe it or not, there are still more road races to come this year. Starting today, in fact, and by the time this video is out, the Copa Agostoni is likely to have finished, but you can catch up with that on demand on GCN Plus later if you so wish. Valverde, Guillaume Martin, Trentin, Luxenko, Hermans and Viviani are amongst the stars who are competing there. And many of them will also be competing on Wednesday and Sunday at the Giro del Veneto and the Veneto Classic respectively. And that will pretty much round out the road season for the men's peloton. Now the Giro del Veneto is a race with a long history, having first taken place 99 years ago. And the organisational side of things has been taken over for that race by former pro Pipo Pozzato. And he's added two new events this year. The Veneto Classic on Sunday, but also a gravel race specifically designed for pro riders, which will take place on Friday. It's called the Serenissima Classic, and whilst there won't be any live coverage of the event, we will have a 45-minute highlight package for you a day or two after it's taken place. And it's going to be interesting to see how many pros turn up for that one, which is a much shorter event than traditional gravel ones such as the Unbound over in Kansas. Also this week, we've got the British National Championships taking place for the first time since June of 2019. On Friday night, it's the Criteriums, and on Sunday, it's the Road Races, both of which will be live on GCN+. Saturday's time trials will have highlights, meanwhile. Before that, on Thursday morning, it's the Tour de France route presentation. Now, this is always much anticipated, although those of you with a keen eye will already have seen many of the rumours flying about. You'll be able to see the exact route for that 2022 race, though, on Thursday morning. And we should also have our own summary video coming out later that day. Away from road racing, there is cyclocross action pretty much every weekend between now and mid-February. But this week, there are a total of four races on. The second and third rounds of the UCI World Cup in Fayetteville and Iowa on Wednesday and Sunday respectively. And then round five and six of the USCX series on Friday and Saturday, also in Iowa. Please check territory restrictions where you are for all those races that I've just mentioned. Beyond all of that, we are also very pleased to say that we've got the Zwift Racing League live on our free-to-view channels for the next six Mondays. It all kicks off tonight at 7pm BST. Now in its fourth season, it's been gaining popularity each and every year, but even if you've never watched it before, I'd encourage you to tune in tonight to see what it's all about. We're going to have a live pre-show for you to bring you up to speed on all of the rules, who's riding, etc. And we've also got Hannah Walker here to provide her expert insight, both pre- and post-race. Commentary will be from Hannah herself, along with Matt Stevens and Dave Toll, and it will be me and Si here on the sofa with Hannah. Make sure you join us. But now seems like a good time to get onto the cyclocross action from yesterday, which was the first round of the UCI World Cup in Waterloo. In the women's, the start list was off the charts. Lucinda Brandt, the world champion, and Mariana Voss, the star attractions. However, it was the Canadian champion, Magali Rochette, who got off to the best start. Now, we've seen her on great form at the US Cyclocross Series, winning three of the opening four rounds, and she was clearly not overawed by the big names that she was facing yesterday. However, she was unable to maintain her position at the front, as yet again, the Dutch dominated. On the final lap, Brandt and Voss were trading blows, but none of them were knockouts, with the woman on the receiving end always able to get back into contention. Also in contention, despite an early mechanical problem, was Denise Betzema. She was there or thereabouts in the final lap, but in the end, it was a two-up sprint between Voss and Brandt, and it was the rider from Jumbo Visma who was triumphant in front of the huge American crowds. That marked her first Cyclocross World Cup win since Boxing Day in 2018. Second in the World Champs on the road, second at Paris-Roubaix last Sunday, and now Voss is the boss of cross. What an incredible athlete she is. World Champion Brandt would have to settle for second on the day, Betzma third, and then a great ride by the Olympic mountain bike champion Yolanda Neff saw her climb from the fourth row of the grid to fourth place at the finish. 
Voss, incidentally, was riding on a brand new and as yet unreleased Cervelo cyclocross bike on Sunday. And I have no doubt that Ollie and Alex will take a closer look at that in the tech show this week if you're interested. In the men's, conditions were the same as the women's at the start, dry and fast, but then the heavens opened and it caused chaos. Riders such as Quinton Hermans and Thibaut Nice were amongst those that came down, whilst the whole field was busy trying to communicate with their team in the pits to lower the pressure of their tyres. Michael Van Turenhout had been leading the race, but he too slipped out on a corner, which allowed Ellie Isabet to get back into contention. And he didn't need a second invite. He would later drop his compatriot, coming to the line with half a minute to spare and plenty of time to take in the applause of the course side fans. And whilst it was an all Dutch podium in the women's race, it was an all Belgian in the men's. Herman's able to get himself back up and into third place by the time he got to the finish. I will move over now though to the boards of the European Track Championships where there was so much action last week. The Dutch remain as strong as ever in the sprint events. They took gold and silver in the men's sprint with Harry Lovrason and Geoffrey Hoagland respectively. Uh, Hoagland took the win in both the Karen and the 1K time trial though. The Dutch won both the men's and women's team sprints, with Shanna Braspernix also taking the individual sprint. Uh, Britain's Katie Archibald had a very successful week though, taking both the Madison, Scratch and then the Omnium, where she won every single one of the events. Germany won the women's team pursuit, beating Italy by over seven seconds, whilst the Danes were back to their winning ways in the men's pursuit, beating Switzerland by just over a second. The track season really is starting to get into full swing now. The World Championships are coming up later this month and the brand new UCI Track Champions League will be hot on the heels of that. In other news, Tanya Erat will have to undergo spinal surgery this week after a nasty crash on the opening day of the women's tour. The Tibco Silicon Valley rider suffered multiple fractures in her fall, but has made her way back to Germany where she'll have that surgery this week. We wish her all the best in her recovery. There have been a couple of team car transfers over the last week. Sherry Pridham, who made headlines at the start of this year by becoming the first ever female sports director in a male World Tour team, will move on from the Israel startup nation over to Lotto Soudal in 2022, whilst Rolf Aldag is moving from Bahrain Victorious over to Bora Hansgrohe next year. In rider transfer news, Joe Dombrowski is once again heading to a new home. Having spent two years at UAE Team Emirates, where he took a stage win at the Giro d'Italia this year, he is now headed to Astana, where he will spend at least the next two seasons. Dombrowski's other former team, EF Education Nippo, have signed Ben Healy, the former Irish road champion. Uh, Healy won a stage at the Tour de l'Avenir in 2019, when he was still just 18 years of age, and also won a stage of the Giro Ciclista d'Italia this year. And that will be welcome news for Irish cycling fans who had to say goodbye to both Dan Martin and Nico Roach last week. Martin had already announced his retirement just before the Tour of Britain, but Roach revealed his news just last week. Both have had very long and successful careers. Dan Martin won two monuments over the course of his, and Roach took two stages of the Welter, a race in which he also finished fifth overall in 2013. We wish them both all the best in whatever comes next for them, and let's hope they stay in the sport in some sort of capacity. Corin Rivera, who is now Corin Labecki after marrying her partner last week, will move to Jumbo Visma next year after five years with Team DSM, whilst the Koenig Quickstep have signed talented young Brit Ethan Vernon, who won a stage of the Tour de l'Avenir this year. Right, that's all for this week. I'm going to be taking a break next week, but the racing news show will be back in the capable hands of Connor Dunn. Take care, everyone. I will see you soon.